Welcome to Survivor Dispatch uh, Insider. This is Charlie Hogwood with ReadyGoPrep.com. Today we're going to talk about the five overlooked roles in community in your survival group. And um, so the reason that we talk about the overlooked roles is because so often we have groups that come together and they say, well, I'm only together because we're worried about, you know, our neighbor stealing something or we're worried about maybe a storm or something like that or it doesn't matter what our roles are in the group because we have everybody has firearms so we'll just go take what we need that doesn't really always work out effectively so what we want to do is we want to talk about the members of the group that are going to provide that added value that is going to help you get through some of the hard times through some strategic planning through some food planning through some engineering and so forth so the first person that i want to talk about within the group that is kind of overlooked even though assumed is going to be the person who manages the food the nutrition and the water management and planning of the nutrition and water management water doesn't always just come out of the tap one of the reasons that we prepare for emergencies is if the water stops running so where are we going to get that water if you're counting on the water coming out of the tap and you think you're going to be good to go with your, your, your kitchen filter that goes in the refrigerator and you're all set, that might not be the case. So let's start thinking ahead a little bit and let's start saying, okay, where's that water going to come from? How are we going to prepare it? How many people do we need to prepare our water for? And what, what method of preparedness are we going to use it that's going to take the most or least time? So those all make a difference. And if you've seen any of the on TV survival shows where the, the fire goes out because they improperly planned for the amount of firewood they need or, or how, you know, who's gonna stay up and watch it, it's the same thing with all of your resources, water included. So if your water is outside of your safe zone for your group, outside of your perimeter perhaps, and you've gotta go fetch that water and bring it back in any quantity to feed your people and to, and to nourish your people, then you might have to start thinking about the security to get there. How often do we need it? How are we going to carry it? We know that water weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon. If that's the case and we need five gallons a day roughly per person and we've got 20 people, when you start doing the math, we're carrying an awful lot of water. Now, water also doesn't need to all be purified or treated for all of our uses. Mostly for uh, whatever we're going to use for food, whatever we're going to use for medical, that kind of stuff, that's where we need our clean water. If it was for flushing toilets or doing dishwashing, it won't have to be clean to the, to the purity that we would need for first aid. So we start thinking about that. So it's a good idea to get somebody in your group who's focused on who and how are they going to manage the water. Where are we going to get it? How are we going to do it? How are we going to take care of that? The other, that same person may also be designated to handle the nutrition. Who, how many people do we have to feed? How long do we need to feed them? Do we need to grow food? Do we need to procure food? Are we using food that we've already got in our pantry? Who's guarding the food? How do we calculate the calories per person? So the reason I say that that person is really overlooked is perhaps everybody knows that they need to do these things, but they're not actively considering what goes on behind the scenes that needs to happen to manage that resource effectively. That is gonna be your nutrition and your water support person. The next person that I think I'd like to bring up is going to be the medic. We all know that we like to have a medic in the group. That's pretty obvious. But again, just like we did with all of our other resources, how many people are we taking care of? How well trained is that medic? Is that medic understand more uh, basic life skills, advanced life skills? And does that person have the equipment and the skills that they need to perform those duties? So when you look at your medic, start really thinking about, okay, what skill level is this person at? And if we're expecting danger, gunfights, knife injuries, axe injuries, is that person really able to manage those injuries? Does that person need an assistant? So my recommendation is that you really establish a set medic and perhaps an assistant, and even better, make sure that that person who's well-trained in, in the first aid is also cross-training every member of the group so that you create that redundancy. Because if your medic gets injured, then you're really gonna be in trouble if you don't have some backup skills going on. So that's why I really call out the medic and the people that we overlook a lot of times. The next person I think I'd like to look at is what I would call the negotiator or the mediator. In a survival group, a lot of times you run into these problems inside the group where things just don't get better in a, in a time of austere conditions or survival. So there might be some bickering, there might be some complaining, there might be some uh, dissension amongst the troops, if you will. And it doesn't hurt to have somebody who can come back and say, 
hey, all right, let's break this out a little bit. Let's talk about it. Everybody back to their corner. Let's work out the problems before they get worse. If you don't address the smaller problems early on and keep that morale at a decent level, it's going to get worse and worse. And then the number of people that you have in your group are going to begin to polarize. They're going to start to separate. And then you're really going to have infighting in the group. The last thing you need in a dis disaster or austere condition is infighting from within. You've got enough targets on the outside, if you will, who are trying to get in and address you. So let's look at the mediator. Now, who makes the best mediator or negotiator? It might be somebody who's well-respected, soft-spoken, more of the, the grandpa, grandma type of person, somebody that commands that compassion and attention when they walk in the room. Do you know who that is in your group? If you, if you don't, start thinking about that. Who could we have handle our issues of behavior and conflict within the group? The other side of that is not just mediation within the group. If you find that your group is now having problems with an outside group, maybe we're in a situation that's so bad where your survival group is now up against another survival group somewhere else and you're in competition for local resources. Maybe there's a kidnapping. Maybe there's a hostage situation. Maybe somebody was taken from the crops and you know, held as a hostage for ransom by another group. You might want somebody to be able to step up and speak for your group to deal with that situation. Direct conflict and open firearms is not always the, the immediate solution to that. Start with diplomacy if possible, and then ratchet up the conflict as you need to. But have somebody who can walk out and say, listen, we understand we have a problem, and let's find that common ground, see if we can get through it and work this out together. That will be somebody respected within your group. The next person I want to talk to, the fourth person that we overlook commonly in the group, even though, again, is somebody that we commonly have, is going to be the tinkerer, the engineer. The person who can take a bucket of mud and, and turn it into some fancy piece of equipment. Somebody who can take very little and create quite a bit out of it, something useful. So get an old engine running, get a pump repaired, get uh, make some electrical work, uh, sa scavenge some uh, resources out of the town, maybe some solar panels, maybe, you know, again, some pumping equipment, some piping, some wiring, some communication, get an antenna, a windmill up. Anybody who's mechanically inclined, patient, understanding of the mechanics, and able to bring a bunch of things together to create a piece of equipment for you would be a very handy person to have in the group. Because those are the ones that are the ones always able to fix what's broken. You're like, wow, how'd they even do that? So I think a tinkerer is a great person to have. Now, keep in mind that your tinkerer might not always be the most sociable person, the most easily to get along with person within the group, because they're really focused on mechanics. They maybe understand tools better than people. That's just a, a trait that I've noticed among some, a lot of tinkerers in the groups that I've seen. So, but a tinker, amazing find to have in a group. The last person that I want to call out that we would say that might be overlooked within the group, how about the um, strategic planner? Now, is that necessarily the leader of the group? That's my question to you. And my answer is not always. There's a lot of people who really understand the vision, who really can grasp what the group needs, somebody that can well identify what we call the priorities of work, the priorities of resources that we need to acquire, who can understand crew interdependencies and say, okay, well, we need maybe we need to shut down the garden crew over here and get them out on security right now to fortify a perimeter. And then the garden people are like, well, we've got to get our food going or we're not going to have any food. And then the security people might say, well, if we don't have security, we're not going to be able to protect our food. So the strategic planner is going to be able to look at all of the resources that need to be acquired, the jobs that need to be completed, and make some kind of sense out of that. And then most importantly, is going to be able to communicate that plan, that vision, if you will, for buy-in from the group members. The best laid plans will be completely useless if you cannot achieve buy-in from all the people that you're expecting to be able to perform the work to support those plans. So that's why I say somebody who's good with strategic planning, project management, some sort of a management, but yet understands individuals' strengths and weaknesses to put them in the right positions. So could be the leader of the group, could be an elder of the group who doesn't want to lead but has a great understanding of what's going on, who defers the leadership role to someone else. So you see, when it comes to survival groups, there is a lot of things that we can do to really improve our position. And picking the right people and putting them in the roles that they are well-suited for are going to be the best solutions for your group.
So I'm Charlie Hogwood with ReadyGoPrep.com, and I'm here with Survival Dispatch today. Uh, for this and all kinds of other community uh, insider information, check out the webpage, check out the links that they're going to post here on the video, and we'll be back for more later on.